I'm Jack Holden, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hannay, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Holden, and you're listening to... I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. Welcome back to another great episode of Dr. J Radio Live. I'm your host, Dr. J, broadcasting from the City of Angels, or City of Demons, depending upon who you ask, and we are internationally syndicated, starting with our home base at Late Night in the Midlands, along with their terrestrial affiliates in the United States, as well as Black Swamp Digital Radio and the United Kingdom. We have Deprogrammed Radio Network, as well as their terrestrial affiliates in London and Leeds. Today we bring you another two-hour, two-guest show, and two of the top guests, may I add, that you guys will truly, truly enjoy. This first guest is somebody I have been trying to track down and get on the same page as far as calendar for a couple dates, more than a couple dates in a couple months, and we finally were able to do so today. There are so many things I could say about him. From being an author of literally over a dozen books, an adventurer, one of the most visible paranormal researchers of the day, and so much more. I mean, he's appeared on so many different television series, from Ghost Hunters to... I'll let him tell you all that. Let me just introduce my guest in case you guys haven't seen all the social media, which is already out there. And that happens to be the one and only Mr. Jeff Bellinger. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey. Thank you, Dr. J. Great to be with you. It's uh, the pleasure is all here, my friend. It truly is all here. Before I go into well, you know, before I go into your background, since I started to say what television series you appeared in, Ghost Adventures, and I know you have more, Paranormal Challenge, Aftershocks, and PB's PBS's Emmy nominated New England Legends. Did I get all those right, or is there anything missing? No, I think you did. I mean, you know, I've done appearances on other shows, but. I don't know, I guess people can go look up IMDb or something if they're really curious, right? <laughs> That's true. That is very true. That is. So let, let me ask you this, Jeff. At what point did you get started in paranormal and why? You know, what was it about you that interested you and sucked you in? Yeah, so I grew up in an old New England town, and I remember being 10 years old, and my friend down the street lived in this house that was built in, like, 1760. So, I mean, it predated the country. And we would have sleepovers, and it was this amazing old house. And he said, well, you know, it's, it's haunted. And I thought, huh. And the stories he told me didn't sound anything like the Hollywood movies I'd seen or, or anything like that. It was just someone else lives here with us. And I remember his parents saying, yeah, don't tell your parents. They'll think we're crazy. But, yeah, someone else lives here. And this was back in the 80s, before ghosts were very much out of the closet. They were still in the closet back then, back in those, those early 80s. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I was just, I was intrigued. And I also, I grew up in the town next to Ed and Lorraine Warren, who, of course, worked on the Amityville case, and their cases most recently have been made into some pretty big feature films, like The Conjuring and things like that. So I knew them since I was about 10 years old. Uh, Lorraine Warren went to our church, and I was just kind of around this ghost lore and history. And uh, as I went to college, I wanted to be a writer, and I started writing for newspapers and magazines. And around October, you go looking for haunted feature stories, and I was no different. And I just got sucked in little by little. It wasn't a plan. It wasn't some grand design. It was, that's a cool story. I like ghost stories. I like history. And then suddenly I started my own website, and then I started writing books, and then I started working in television. And it's one of those things where one day I woke up and I went, oh, my, this is my full-time job now. How did that happen? And uh, I guess it's just a series of steps or missteps, depending on your perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I haven't looked back since. It, it's got to be a combination of pa uh, passion, which obviously drives you for who you are today. And if you like what you can do and it's a job, a hobby turns into a job, that's the dream career for anybody. Literally, that is the dream career. Yeah, no, you're right. And I'm blessed. I'm blessed to be able to do this. And I, at this point, I feel like... I, I'm not saying I have all the answers. In fact, I, I used to have all the answers. It's a shame you didn't interview me like 15 years ago because I knew everything. <laughs> uh, and sadly, the longer I've been doing this and the more I've been learning, um, I, I've lost all of it. I realize I, I know almost nothing, so I apologize ahead of time to your listeners. But uh, but I, I've learned a lot about myself, and that was a very worthwhile journey. And it has been, and it's still going. I'm still learning so much every day. 
and that's uh, that's that's a big part of why I do this. You you raise another good point. I you said you know if I had interviewed you 15 years ago, you would have known or remembered all those. But at the same time, I feel that if I was interviewed for a show on UFOs 10, 15 years ago, I would know far more today, meaning that the more answers I get, they open up to 10 plus more questions. So I am probably sure. further lost now than I was <laughs> back then. Yeah, no, I think what it is is that, you know, back then I just repeated the stuff you've read in books and heard on television. I, I would just say, you know, oh, well, a ghost is this or this is that and because I just took those things as, as fact. And over time I've learned maybe not so. Uh, and that just comes from climbing a mountain of, of research and data and stories and talking to thousands of people at this point, realizing that not everything falls simply <laughs> into a little box, especially when we're talking about subjects that, most people call the paranormal. I, I, I think we're talking about human behavior and, and human thoughts and emotions. And so far, there's a whole field of psychiatry which is in, and psychology, which is a huge, huge industry worldwide. And they don't have it all figured out yet. So I'm not sure what chance I have. But I do think, again, that we can learn a lot about ourselves, about our past, about our place in the world and the universe and maybe even where we're going. You mentioned a key word, and I'm not going to ask this question as a rhetorical question. I'm asking it for a reason. I know the answer. The listeners clearly know the answer, but that doesn't mean the answers that we have are the correct answer because depending on who you ask, they'll give you a different answer. For instance, Grant Wilson's explanation of what a ghost was is very different from what I used to think. So that's my question to you. What yeah. is a ghost by definition in what you've been able to uncover in the last 30 some years? Sure. So, uh, Dr. J, I wrote an entire book trying to answer that very question. And I'm not even going to say the name of the book because I wrote hundreds of pages and I'm here admitting I failed. I couldn't <laughs> define it with hundreds of pages, but I think I've got it narrowed down to this. A ghost is history demanding to be remembered. It's the past coming to the present. That, that exactly is exactly what it is. Actually, the best statement I've ever heard, Jeff. Honestly, the best statement because that's exactly what they, what I perceive them to be. Whether they be from 50 years ago to 500 years ago, or if you're in America, the Native American speaking, whether it be Cherokee, just like you said, it's the past trying to be remembered because we have to keep our history in in our minds uh, for multiple reasons. One, as a civilization, because if we did something wrong, then we are doomed to repeat it if we don't look at our history. Not to mention, it's part of who we as a society have become today. And so I think that past is very relevant. And I would think that's what drove you to also say that statement because of the fact that it is uh, you know we wouldn't be who we are today if we did not follow our past and keep records of our past well not only that from a purely egocentric point of view we are all comprised of every moment of our lives right you you are the summation of all your life experiences how you were raised uh, religions you were exposed to or not exposed to, uh, all that stuff, right? And uh, even to the point of the, the person that made your coffee this morning, if you happen to go to a coffee shop, right? You had an interaction with that person, and they affected you in some way. You would assume the coffee shop person would be minimal, however, something. And then, like, mom and dad would be huge, right? I mean, they would have a, a huge impact on shaping who you are. And all of those people are a product of their upbringing and their parents and their parents before them. And so all of us are just this sum total of all the history that came before us. And if you want to understand your place in the world and the universe or whatever, I think you do yourself a disservice to not look back. Yes, yes. Especially, like you said, in a micro sense of the word within ourselves and our own experiences. Like you mentioned, the barista who made the coffee this morning, you know. Right. If I don't remember her, well, you know, what, what's that going to do down the line considering there was an interaction there? It may be yeah. bigger in her head than my head, or I may just be another customer, and I may, may be remembering it more so than her 
for another reason. But regardless, it is part of who I am and what I've experienced. Now, this is probably going to be hard to ask or answer. It to answer it, not hard to ask. Is if you could just at least approximate. How many cases that you have worked on from whether it be sending a team out to research for ghosts or a haunted area or that you yourself did? If you were just to guess a number, what would it be? Hundreds, maybe a thousand plus, what would you say? I mean, if I'm being realistic, I, I mean, I would include every episode of Ghost Adventures I've worked on, which is over 200. I would include everything that's been in my books, which is, you know, another several hundred uh, things that never made it into books or otherwise, uh, I would guess it's probably approaching, probably approaching a thousand, if I'm being honest. Um, I think, you know, there's paranormal investigators I've met that are like, I've looked into 3,000 cases, and I'm like, how old are you? Because I'm going to start dividing days by age. And, you know, you're like, that would be like four cases a day. You know, like, how do you do that? Uh, but no, I would say, I would say probably the, the better part of a thousand uh, I've worked on in 20 years. Throughout those 20 years, and, and, you know, I wouldn't doubt, Jeff, if it's reached a 1,000 at this point, like you said, through everything you've contributed to and things that you haven't even mentioned in your books and in through the shows and through your own interviews. Of what you've experienced, if we could just pick a few from your memory of what sticks out in your memory, what are some of the most memorable for positive reasons and then the opposite side of the question for negative reasons, meaning experiences with benign, both strange, and experiences with strange malevolent. So you mean like something paranormal, something beyond? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, uh, first of all, it, it's important to say that I'm not an overly sensitive kind of person. I don't see these things everywhere I go. And in fact, for years, years I was writing about ghosts and, and haunted places, and I had never seen one. I didn't grow up in a haunted house. I was at my friend's house. We had sleepovers. We'd break out the Ouija board, but I never had an experience where I would say, oh, yeah, that's a ghost. Not yet. That took, that took some time. Uh, it was actually 2003. Uh, I had been doing this for years, writing about it for years. I had books out. You know, uh, um, actually, not quite yet books out, but I mean, I've been writing about it for my website and doing different things. And I was in the city of Paris and down in the catacombs. And, and, you know, I was there for a, a work trip, and I had one day to myself, and my colleagues are going to the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay, and I said, you know, I'm going underground, and uh, not surprisingly, no one wanted to come with me. Of course, <laughs> so yeah. I, they wanted to see the Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair, you know. Uh, so I go down below the city, and it's very quiet down there. There's 300 kilometers of tunnels that go all underneath the city of Paris. And these date back a long time. Paris itself is almost 2,000 years old. It was a Roman outpost at one point and then grew into a village, into a town, into a city. And as it grew, uh, eventually they needed cemeteries and graveyards, as all cities do. And you put those on the outskirts, which most cities do as well. But over centuries, those outskirts aren't outskirts anymore. I mean, Paris just sprawled and sprawled. And by the, the mid-1800s, they had a huge problem because the buildings are getting bigger and heavier and the ground underneath is hollow and the cemeteries have no, room, no more room for bodies. I mean, this corpse is spilling into the streets. So they're going to empty these cemeteries and then fill in these, these tunnels. And uh, in doing so, you're disturbing a place of the dead, which is kind of a universal taboo. I mean, most, most cultures really frown on that. But, of course, the living always take precedent. So I'm down there, and it's 30 meters below the city, and it's incredibly quiet. You just hear the drip of water coming through limestone, the crunch of gravel under my feet as I'm walking. And I get to this doorway that says in French at the top, stop, this is the empire of the dead. And as I walk through, there are literally millions of human skeletons all around me. And this very macabre, very intricate pattern. They're right there. You can touch them. And I admit it. You're not supposed to, but I did. It's just, I, I don't know what it was, but you're looking at this empty eye socket skull staring back at you and saying, I need to touch it. I need to know it's real. I need to, and, and right now, I can close my eyes right now, and I can remember the feel of that that gritty, sandy, cold uh, skull on my finger. It was right there. And as I'm walking through this, this very macabre setting with these, these rows of skulls all around me, I'm in this narrow hallway, and suddenly I see the shadow, the size of a man, move from the right side to the left, and then he darted back. I say he, because it seemed masculine. I didn't really see features. And I froze. And I went, okay, wait a minute. 
no one could have come up from behind me. They would have literally bumped into me. It's too narrow right here. And then I thought, well, okay, maybe there's a little side tunnel up ahead. And someone's down here with me, and I just missed them. And I walk ahead, and there's, there's no side tunnel. It's just a long straightaway. And I went, okay, this is what everyone's talking about. All those people I'd interviewed, hundreds at that point, uh, they, they didn't ask for it. They, they were just in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, depending on your perspective. And it's the kind of thing that uh, it, it, it affected me because it, it took days, weeks, months to sink in. You know, you, you, I walk out and I just went, I think I just saw a ghost. I, I can't, I don't have another word for that. I don't have any other thing in my lexicon to tell you what that thing was other than a ghost. And I come back to the surface, and it's a bright city again, and it's loud and noisy and all the things that cities are. And I just went, okay, that's kind of a game changer. And I always try to be this, uh, this, this objective journalist when it, when it comes to everything that I do. And at that point, I went, I think I lost a little objectivity. I, I would have to call myself a believer at this point. And that was profound. I mean, it's a big thing. When someone has an experience of what they believe to be a, a ghost, a spirit, whatever, the message ultimately is, Something happens after we die. Something continues in some maybe very tangible way. And every one of us has to come to grips with that. Uh, whether you're an atheist and disbelieve or whatever, once you have that experience that you can't explain away, it's a game changer. Yeah. And so that was profound. Yeah, I would say that that would wake you up and bring you to senses and a new set of beliefs. Like you mentioned, an atheist or anybody like that who believes that once we die, you know, we're nothing but dust after we're buried but what you saw obviously if you were able to see a shadow in your underground i'm thinking there's no way for a light to create this shadow because there was no one down there with you obviously for to have a shadow of a man moving across right right when something weird happens around me i'm the very first person to say like okay how can we let's let's debunk it let's figure it out let's reproduce it and, you know, sometimes you'll see a curtain waving and, and you say, okay, did someone just walk by? Oh, yeah, I just walked by. All right, fair enough. That's all it was. Uh, so I, that's my first instinct always. But then when you can't explain it, when you run through everything and you go, huh, I'm out of ideas. Those are moments I live for. Uh, I remember once seeing Michael Shermer, who's the... Uh, the yes, skeptic, skeptic, skeptic Magazine. magazine. Yes, yeah. yes. I, I saw him give a, a talk and he was great. He's a great speaker and, and, and really smart. And he said, look, 99% of this stuff can all be explained. And I wanted to leap up and say, I agree with you. It's that 1% that really keeps me up at night. <laughs> you know, like, I totally agree that we can explain a lot of this stuff. But it's that the, the little that we can't, that, uh, that I, that's the realm I try to live in. And, and it's been an adventure. And that has to... You could say the same about all paranormal activity, uh, even UFOs. And just, I'm not talking about the meaning of anything unidentified. Actual things that may possibly be non terrestrial craft or maybe super advanced craft from the United States. You know, most of those, it's only a handful because the rest are regular anomalies. You know, whether it be uh, someone. You know, photographing something from a different point of view and, and maybe seeing a new drone out and be like, oh, great, we have a new triangle, extraterrestrials coming down. You know, to have that healthy skepticism, Jeff, is super, super important. Now, let, let me ask you something about shadow men and women in general. And sure. I don't normally like to bring in what someone else has said, but I feel it's important enough because I got this and I've never, ever heard this explanation in my entire life. I asked Grant Wilson this from Ghost Hunters, and I said to him, I, I said, well, when I asked him what some of the most memorable things he did, he said, well, I usually try to ask them, the ghosts, how they see us and his answer was that they see us as shadows did you come across around that at all because that to me started to make some sense because if we are seeing them as shadows a lot of the times maybe his conclusion i mean i'm sure requires a lot more testing could be a plausible one that i never considered yeah, you know, I, I just don't know. I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not psychic or sensitive. I've never been dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Full disclosure, you know. Uh, um, I, I don't, I think the, 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 to borrow a quote, you know, the universe is stranger than we can even imagine. Uh, and and I, I don't, 
I don't know. I heard a, a psychic tell me very recently that uh, that spirits see us as glowing blobs. So if a few of us are standing together, we might look like one person. And if we're all spread out, we might look like individuals. And and I said, well, I don't know. It's a, it's a good as idea as any, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I can't even comment on it. I don't know. I have no no point of reference on something like that other than what people report to me. And while I've interviewed plenty of living people that have seen shadow figures, I have yet to interview a shadow figure. So uh, th- thank sure. you. Thank you. That was going to be my question right there. How, how can we? I mean, what are the chances we're going to set one up for, hey, uh, the January 2nd, 11 p.m. Uh, or 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, hey, shadow person, be available for an interview? I don't think it sort of works that way. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it did, because that would be amazing. I mean, I would love that interview. That would be that would be something. I've, I've, I've made the joke in some of my, my public lectures and stuff, and I said, look, if I could, if I had a, uh, someone, someone asked me the question once, you know, uh, how do we, how do we make them move on or, or, or whatever? And I've always said, I've never found any place, any building or otherwise that is haunted 100% of the time, because if I did, I would buy it and I would charge you money to see it. <laughs> Hands yes. down. If the ghost is always there, I'd be like, 20 bucks to look, you know, 50 to come in. I'll hold the door. There it is. Wave, ghost, right? I mean, that would be amazing. But I've never found such a case. I've never found a place where it's always there. It seems to come and go uh, through factors that are beyond me, beyond all of us. And sometimes, you know, lightning strikes. Sometimes you're in a place and and, and you see it. You hear it. You mentioned earlier Ouija boards, and a lot of people look down on them and say, hey, they invite uh, demonic activity to you and things like that. Uh, Me, myself, just like you, Jeff, I still use the Ouija board, and I can't say I've had any negative experiences, but I can honestly say a lot of guests over the years have tried to scare me away from that whole idea. What's your take on it, Uh, objectively, for me and the listeners? about them using Ouija boards. Well, you have to look down on them, literally, because they don't work if you're, like, above you, right? I mean, you have to have them on a table or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. I've never found anything evil, uh, inherently evil or otherwise, about plastic and cardboard. But I do think the history of the Ouija board is amazing. Uh, this, this product, and Ouija is a trademark, a registered trademark that goes all the way back to the 1890s to the Kennard Novelty Company in Baltimore, uh, and, and keep in mind, before that, the generic term is talking boards. It's almost like how people say, like, oh, go, go to your Xerox machine to make a copy, a photocopy, even though it might not be a Xerox machine or a Kleenex, which is a trademark. So it's a trademark name, and, uh, and there's a lot of mystery around it, and it was a hugely, wildly popular parlor game. In 1967, it outsold Monopoly. Yes. That is huge. I mean, this is, that's, that's huge. That's beyond huge. And everybody knows it. When you say Ouija, everyone knows what you're talking about, and, and they, they do have feelings on it. I recall being in uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren's house, and their phone would ring off the hook. This is long before the days of the Internet and things like that. People would just call them. And Lorraine was, was so sweet. She was like everybody's grandma, and she'd pick up the phone. And I only heard one side of it, but it would be like, hello? Okay. Oh, yeah, honey. Oh, that sounds bad, honey. Tell me, is there a Ouija board in the house? <laughs> oh, you've got to get rid of that, honey. You've got to get rid of it right away. And I remember when I when, later on when I would learn, you know, the Ouija board outsold Monopoly. If I were to ask you, Doctor J, is there a Monopoly game in your house? Like, I don't know if you have kids or anything, but I know. have one Monopoly or two, but yet I have three Ouija boards. I'm just saying. Imagine if you said, "Boy, there's something weird going on in my house," and I said, "Is there a Monopoly board in your house?" And, oh my God, there is. I mean, this is the, the most wildly popular selling board game in the history of humankind, right? Like. There is one in my house. Oh, you got to get rid of that right away. You know, <laughs> this thing teaches greed and all, everything else. That being said, Ouija boards are wildly interesting to me. They were never dangerous back in the 1910s, 1920s. The Saturday Evening Post has a drawing by Norman Rockwell of a man and a woman using a Ouija board together. They made Ouija oil, Ouija jewelry, Ouija, Ouija, Ouija. It was huge. It was crazy popular. But it turned dark in the 1970s. That's when everything changed. In 1971, 1973, this guy named William Peter Blatty changed it all when he wrote a book and then later became a movie called The Exorcist. Oh, <laughs> that, yes. And in that movie, or if you recall, uh, Reagan's in the basement playing all alone with a Ouija board. And that's how Blatty sort of used that as a a literary device to get the demon into the girl. Like, that became the gateway. And that also became 
the the reference point for so many paranormal people. Like, did you see that movie? That can really happen. You can't do that. And the irony is that they're quoting a, a work of fiction. Um, here, here's the thing. If you are afraid of them, if you think they open doorways to evil, I don't think you should use them. I don't yeah. think that's a good idea. Yeah. If you're like, eh, it's, it's no more or less harmful than anything else you've seen on all the paranormal shows. It's insane to me when someone's like, those things are dangerous, keep them away from me. Now I'm going to turn on my audio recorder and ask if there's any spirits here. Or I'm going to use dowsing rods. I'm like, are you insane? It's the same thing. Same thing. thing. Yeah. You don't know what's over there. You're saying, come communicate with me through this audio recorder or through these dowsing rods. That's safe, but the Ouija board's dangerous? That's just not consistent thinking to me. Uh, however, I, I can respect that some people are intimidated by one thing over another and get better results. Fine, no problem. But I think you either, if it's dangerous, then maybe it's all dangerous and stay away from all of it. Or if you get better results with one and then the other, fine, but don't judge one. <laughs> like it's, that's, that's just not consistent. You, you made a great point that people are using a piece of fiction. So this is more like myth versus reality. And oh, if, I... if it outsold Monopoly in, I th you think you said 66 or in, yep. in the 60s? 67, yeah. 67, that just blows my mind. Now, I've never heard from anybody the history of the Ouija board until you and so I have a question about that because this is really fascinating Jeff sure so you said in the 1890s it came out as the talking board and it was the well no, no that's the generic term talking board all of them are called talking board 1890s it was Ouija the brand name Ouija came out Okay, gotcha so th that was the brand name but what they wore was the talking board and yep. Parker Brothers now owns them and like Hasbro. You said, ha Hasbro, sorry, and yep. and still okay. markets them to the children or anybody. I mean, the I think the ages eight, eight, eight to ninety nine is something like that, yeah. well, right? So right. my question is is going back to the eighteen nineties when the name was trademarked. Was this a game or or a board that was used? You said in parlors used primarily by adults and then sort of segue into children? Or at what point did Hasbro, if you know this part of history, start marketing this towards children? Yeah, okay. So th this is a great story, right? So the Ouija board and the talking board, it's, they're all talking boards, right? It's a byproduct of the spiritualist movement which started in 1848 in Hinesville, New York. It has its roots earlier than that, of course, but that's a big line in the sand. When the Fox sisters heard knocking on the wall, they named it Mr. Splitfoot. They answered, and, and pretty soon, within days, people witnessed the, the first like public display of mediumship. And then they went on tours. They were the Jonathan Edwards, the Sylvia Browns, the whoever you're into, uh, of psychics of their day. And I, I would submit to you that the spiritualist movement might have died out if not for the U.S. Civil War. So just a, a decade later, you've got a nation ripped apart, and thousands upon thousands, tens of thousands of people are dying untimely deaths, really quickly, it's senseless, it's brother against blood, brother, it's family members dying all day long. And when you're in a period of great turmoil and great loss, you need answers. And people go to their churches, their, their synagogues, or whoever their, their religious leaders are for answers. And sometimes the answers just aren't that good, or you don't like them. You know, why did, why did my husband die, my son die, my brother die in the war? Well, God's plan. That's not good enough for me. And so people started seeking out the services of these mediums who would offer them really bona fide answers that would give them uh, direct contact or allegedly whatever. So there was plenty of charlatans back then, but there were yes. people that believed in some of these folks and were happy to pay them and get some answers and, and, and maybe communicate with their loved ones. And pretty soon, the talking board, keep in mind, you're not going to have a, a commercially successful product like a talking board when the literacy rate is like you know, 10, 20 percent in the country. So you can't read. The Ouija board does you no good. That's <laughs> so, true. That's true. <laughs> so the literacy rate's climbing, especially post Civil War. It, people are, are, you know, schools are getting organized. The country's getting back on its feet. We're educating the masses. People can read. Newspapers are big. You know, all this stuff. And so now that you can read, the the talking board takes the the mediumship out of the hands of a potential charlatan and puts it in yours. You just pay me one time a buck, whatever the heck they cost back then, and now I'll give you this, and you can go home and communicate all day long. You get to keep it forever. And that sounded pretty good to a lot of people. Damn and right, that, yeah. Yeah, so the Canard Novelty Company said, that makes sense. Let's cash in on this. They're just business people. And 
uh, Kennard and his partners started the Ouija company in Baltimore, and then it grew and grew. Uh, eventually, this guy named William Fold, if you've ever looked down on the board, it often says the William Fold talking board. Yes. He eventually takes over the company. It's so hugely successful. There was a, an interview with the Fold family as they're standing in front of their palatial mansion, and the reporter asks them, does this thing really work? And they, they look around at their, their mansion and their nice cars and stuff, and they said, well, it worked for us. <laughs> of course it did. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, so eventually, uh, Fold sells it to Parker Brothers, who used to manufacture it in Salem, Massachusetts, for a little while, because that's where they had their, uh, their manufacturing uh, plant. And then Parker Brothers was bought by Hasbro. And so uh, it's been around parlors and, and classic board games for over a century. And, and as with anything, you know, if adults are using it, kids say, hey, what is that? And, um, you know, a, a adults feel nostalgia and pass down board games to their kids. And eventually it becomes this thing to do, especially at sleepovers. So, yeah, it's, it's been around. It's part, of, it's part of the fabric of America. Whether you believe that it's just psychosomatic, we're just both sort of inching it along and one of us is tapping into something subliminal, or if you believe that you're really communicating with your dead grandma... I don't, they don't care. Just buy it. Just, Just buy it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more, more than one. Like I said, I have you know three in this house. I one that was bought for meant for an adult, still produced by Hasbro. A very old one. That's why I said Parker Brothers, which I believe yeah. it has that name on there. And another one that was sort of uh, passed down from, uh, you know, a friend's father who uh, who's friend who my friend was actually too intimidated to use the board for the reasons we said earlier so yeah i'm glad we're breaking the stigma jeff it's very important that people uh just don't get frightened too much based on the fiction uh, literally i mean because that, right. that's when you cross myth versus reality and if someone's had a bad experience and says, look, I, I, it, it said messages I wasn't comfortable with, or, or I was, yeah, fine, don't touch it. That's okay. I'm not telling people to use them. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying, please understand the history. I get it. Sometimes you, you burn your hand so, so badly on a stove, you're afraid to cook again. Okay, I get it. I understand. I mean, you know, you don't want to live a life too long with, with things intimidating you. However, I understand it. Um, but at least know where it's coming from and make your own educated decision. Yes, yes. And, and like you said, it, it's, you know, for each person, if they've had a bad experience, well, then, hey, you've had a bad experience, maybe some other sort of divination. If that's what you're looking to do works for you. As you mentioned, some people will say, oh, no, not the Ouija board. Let me get my dowsing rods or, or eat right. my keys or things like that. Well, then, you know, you're still using divination when it comes down to it. That That's that's the, uh, the ultimate... I guess line right there. Now, yeah. So, so just real quick, so I, my second book ever was called Communicating with the Dead. I'm not really plugging it. I don't even know if you can find it anymore. I'm not sure it's in print. However, uh, that book documented the history of all kinds of spirit communication methods and devices, like the Ouija board. And uh, it was strange because the book's called Communicating with the Dead. And again, some, the publisher chose that title. Um, I, I got to go on some radio shows, and it was rather interesting. People just assumed I was a medium, and I went, "Oh no, 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 no!" Right? Like I, <laughs> I can't help you there. And it was, uh, it was, it was quite entertaining and, and tempting at times to just give someone a message, and just because I think I could BS with the best of them. However, um, I'm, uh, I'm glad to say I never did. I, I didn't abuse it. But, but yeah, there's, there's, a, there's history. There's a backstory to everything, and that's what I've built my career on. Like. How did we get here? What happened before that? And then what happened before that? And what happened before that? I want to know the backstory because it helps me understand today. Now, you mentioned your books and one of the books that you were talking about that you're communicating or talking with the dead. There's another book that you wrote specifically for children about, I, I don't know the exact title, so correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, about the Haunted White House. Yeah, Who's Haunting the White House? That was yes. my first book. For, I've written three books for children. That was my first. And that was a really incredible experience because uh, in my first book, World's Most Haunted Places, that, uh, the White House was a chapter in there. Interesting. And it, it was so, I was like, this is a whole book. I mean, you know, it was only one little section, and I went, there's so much here. Because the White House is a building where everything is really well documented. Because for posterity, uh, you know, every every administration, everybody in there, everything is documented. 
and it's got quite the haunted reputation. And this goes back a long, long way. Uh, it goes back to when the Lincolns were holding seances in the White House. Their son died in there of a typhoid-like disease. So they were so distraught, so broken up over it. Uh, you know, they, they were, Mary Todd Lincoln was, was holding seances. And we know the president attended at least one because there's newspaper clips saying, what the heck is this president doing? Like, you know, that, that's, no one wants to hear about their president going to seances. Yeah. Um, you may remember in the 80s, Ronald Reagan caught a little flack for consulting numerologists. That's right. That's right. Yeah. He did. He did. But yet it happens. And, I, you know, I was just interviewing Dr. Lewis Turry, one of his clients who he was called upon for a reading was Ivanka Trump. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the questions or the reading had to do about uh, national security or anything about this administration. It just goes to show that even to this day, 2018, and we're about to get into 2019, that things are still going up there. And and through history, I'm not trying to uh, give any positiveness towards this era because it was a very very bad era but most people know that adolf hitler and his inner circle were into uh, you know psychics uh, they used numerologists they used a lot of astrology in that period of time to dictate when, when they, they would, would attack this place or so on and so forth fortunately he didn't win i had yeah. several family who lost you know or, or lost their lives to him but the point was is throughout history is that you can see this happening and not just in the white house but globally and i, I think what we're all doing right we're all looking for meaning and uh i get that i totally get that and appreciate that the reality is one of the laws of physics is called entropy, which means the universe moves from an ordered state to a disordered state. You've never in your life, uh, you've, you've, you've no doubt dropped an egg or dropped a glass and watched it shatter at some point in your life. You've never seen the shattered glass come back together and come back up in your hand. That's never happened. You've watched it go from the ordered state to the disordered state. And that is really frightening for some people, that, that this world is chaotic and things like that. So I think some of us look for patterns, look for meaning, and I'm not suggesting they're not there. I've got a friend of mine, Christopher Renstrom, who's an astrologer, and he talked about how astrologers were one of the, the, the first historians, really, who said, you know, uh, when, when, the, when this wandering planet is here, when the moon is there, when the stars are there, um, historically speaking, this has been a bad time for war, or a good time for war, or things like that. And, and some people need any edge they can get. And sometimes knowing you have an edge gives you an edge. And again, whether that's psychosomatic or whether it's the universe working in your favor if you choose to work with it, uh, I don't know. But the end result can often be the same. Going now specifically to what you did with Ghost Adventures, uh, there's a two parts to this question. Is how did you meet Zach Baggins, Aaron Goodwin, and Nick Groff? I believe that's how you say the names. Mm -hmm. And how did you get involved in Travel's uh, Channel's Ghost Adventures? Well, so it was uh, 10 years ago, which is incredible to say about any television show. <laughs> the first show to go 10 years is... Really, really something. something. Most, Most of them, them don't, don't, unless you're like The Simpsons, Simpsons or something. But uh, <laughs> so yeah, right. <laughs> it was back in 2008, and Zach called me and said, "Hey, uh, my, our, our, our friend in common, Dave Schrader, who hosts a radio show as well." And, yes. Yeah. So, so he he, he uh, Zach called him and said, "Look, they they done this documentary that aired on the Sci-Fi Channel." And they said, look, we got picked up on the Travel Channel for a series, just eight episodes, that's all it's going to be. We need someone who knows haunted places all over, and Dave's like, you should talk to Jeff. He's written all these books, and he's the guy. And so I talked to Zach, and I said, all right, eight haunted places in the U.S. for you to investigate? I could do that. That sounds interesting. I've never worked in television. I've worked in newspapers and magazines and books and the web. You know, that's just a different medium. Let's do it. And so eight episodes was all it was supposed to be, and it was very much just getting hired for a job. And it was really, it's been a it's pretty, pretty cool thing, right? This has become kind of a cultural phenomenon. This is more than just a ghost hunting TV show. I mean, it's, it's becoming kind of like a pop culture thing. And, uh, and it's highly visible. And I've been to, you know, on a few episodes, but I've got to work on every single one of them that ever aired on the Travel Channel. And like I said, that's over 200 at this point. And it was only supposed to be eight. So, uh, you know, having worked with someone for 10 years, you, you, it's, it's, it's very much like this co-worker family thing. We know what, what I know what Zach likes. I know what he doesn't like. I know what 
um, what, what makes, makes these guys excited about locations and things, and I just try to give them all the information I can to, to make it as successful as possible, which is what each of us do that, that works on the show. It's, uh, it's really been a, an adventure, not to sound corny, but but it really has, you know, and, and, it, and then I get strange phone calls because people get to be pretty big fans of those guys. And someone recently, you know, got my whole number. Oh, <laughs> And you're like, oh. And they're just like, I need to talk to Zach. And I'm like, you are really barking up the wrong tree. Did you? <laughs> like, like, hold on, let me just give you his number. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know, right here. This is a cold call him. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, just I'll just loop him in. Hold on. Let me, just, yeah. like, like, let no, me get him on three way here for you. Yeah. I don't know what your name is or who you are, but let me just bring yeah. him in for you. I'm sure I won't get fired for this. <laughs> I know, right? Like, no. Are you kidding? So, yeah, so people are uh, – and, and I get it, too. That's been an interesting thing, too. I'm such an armchair sociologist, right? So I get it. Zach's in your living room all Saturday night long. You know, he's, he's on, on the Travel Channel. He's right there with you, and you follow him on Twitter and Facebook, and you, you see what he had for lunch and whatever he chooses to tell you, and you really know him, and he doesn't know you because you can't see through the other way on TV. And, and that's uh, an interesting thing when celebrity becomes – part of the equation, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge as a researcher, right? When you when I call someone and I say, hey, I'm with Ghost Adventures, and they're like, oh, I want to be on TV. I'm like, oh, that's, that's red flag number one. <laughs> like, what else you got, you know? Um, it, ironically, at this point, when someone goes, hey, look, I don't want to be in your books. I don't want to be on TV, but I got something going on here that's really strange. And suddenly I'm like, you have my full attention. <laughs> Those are the people, right? Yeah. Those are the people that you want to actually go to as opposed to the people who want to go to right. on TV yeah. and may have nothing going on. Yeah. Not, 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 to say, I mean, not to say we haven't talked to people and, and that wanted to be on TV that didn't truly have something to add. Many of them do. However... Uh, you know, you, know, you got to be careful when someone, when someone just wants to be on TV and get their, their five minutes of fame or, or, or meet someone famous or, or when they truly are dealing with something that, that they can't explain. And that's what's so fascinating about this. Every day is different. I, I, I joked earlier about 15 years ago, I felt like I knew everything. That, oh, the ghosts fall in like two or three simple boxes. And they just don't. Uh, I think there's as many boxes as there are ghosts. Um, and, and I, I would say that for anything paranormal, because since then I've, I've branched out into other strange stories, from cryptids to aliens, UFOs, all of it, um, because I feel like if you're going to go down the rabbit hole, don't go halfway, you know? <laughs> just, just jump in that sucker and keep going and see where it turns out. Don't dip your toe in. I mean, if you're going to really do it, do it. You actually just segued into something very important for me, which scratches out the other question that I was about to ask. And this has to do with what you just said, that you know you jumped in and started looking at UFOs and other things. I've always felt that paranormal is paranormal. I mean, it's, it's the umbrella of everything. Have you seen any cross of, say, UFOs, ET activity that ended up being perceived as a ghost or... Or, or here's another interesting question. Have you ever come across a spirit of an extraterrestrial? Yeah. Well, I'll answer the second question first because that's quick. No. <laughs> Moving on to the first part. Uh, one of the things that led me into extraterrestrial research was something that we call old hag syndrome. Old hag syndrome is something that tons of people have experienced, arguably upwards of 40%. And what it means is you are laying in bed, you're asleep, generally on your back, although not always, and you suddenly wake up, quite conscious, not even groggy, and you realize you're paralyzed. You can't move. And, and you're, you're very aware of your surroundings. There's my clock radio, my, my dresser, my door, and everything. And then some people will see something coming toward them, like a mass of, of something. And then it's very frightening you, because you're paralyzed. You can't move. And you start to panic. And you're breathing fast. Oh, my God. And then whew, it's over. You can move again. You're unconscious. The, the thing's gone or whatever. Now, I, I've talked to plenty of people that have gone through that experience. Skeptics will say that it's temporary sleep paralysis combined with a hypnagogic hallucination. And we, every night when we sleep, about every 90 minutes, we are paralyzed. That's normal. It's a normal, natural part of sleep because your brain's so active, you'd be flailing around, you could hurt yourself or others, and so we're paralyzed. You can't wake up in the middle of that and be a little short-circuited where your brain didn't send a memo yet. Like, oh, hey, we're awake. You can't move. It happens. So what's fascinating to me, though, is talking to people in different circles and someone going, 
that was an incubus or a succubus. That was absolutely a demonic attack when I was in a prone state of sleep. And I went, okay. And then I talked to someone else who described everything the same all the way down the line and said, yeah, but, you know, I had, I had a lot of bacon right before going to bed. So that's just a hypnagogic hallucination and, a, you know, temporary sleep paralysis. And I went, all right. And then someone else described the same exact thing and said, that was a gray alien and it was an attempted abduction. And I went, huh. and I went huh, well. One of you must be wrong, right, or, or not. And, and so the reality is that we need to fit these strange experiences into some box in our life. So uh, when someone has something happen to them that just doesn't compute, that just this isn't the way I was raised or whatever, this, this shouldn't be, they're going to just go with what they have. It might be their religion. It might be the movies they watch or the books they read or whatever. So a UFO person would say, like, that's a gray alien. Clearly not an incubus or a succubus. A deeply religious person would say, this is a demonic attack. I need to pray more. Uh, someone who's, who's neither might just say, like, oh, that was weird, and write it off and not worry about it again. So that's interesting to me. And that's people interpreting it three wildly different ways. Same thing. It, it is. And I honestly, like you said, we do wake up sometimes where, like you said, the brain doesn't send the memo that, hey, you're still paralyzed, but you're awake. And I have regular sleep paralysis that is not paranormal in any way a lot. And a lot of people are like, oh, you must get abducted. I'm like, no, 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 no. I wake up and I'm paralyzed. And then within seconds or a minute, I'm fully awake to move my arms. No time has passed. There's no missing time. But then there are people, like you just mentioned, for instance, that person who said it was a gray alien on, a gray, on an abduction, who may go from that paralysis and that fear, and then all of a sudden may have missing time. They may wake up wearing someone else's clothes or may end up you know, with mud on their feet when they weren't walking outdoors and things like that. So have you come across people who have genuinely ended up being abducted? Abducted following what they told you? The abduction thing I struggle with. I've, I've, I've hung out with Travis Walton at multiple events, of course, Fire in the Sky, and, um, and I know the Starborn Support Sisters up in Maine, and I've known them for a while, and, and I've talked to people that have claimed that, um, you know, Tom Reed in Massachusetts, this is where I live. He, um, you know, I've been to the, I've, I was there when they commemorated the plaque out there. They did, yeah. yeah. The, the, the governor of Massachusetts actually recognized that. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then, by the way, has de-recognized it. So it's... Oh, I haven't talked to Tom since then. <laughs> this is, and this, to me, that's, that's great, right? So, you know, a, gov a governor will write a proclamation over like, oh, my daughter got her first tooth. And if you're politically connected enough or make enough of a fuss, they'll write a proclamation for that, right? Because... This, this is, is what, what they, they do. do. Oh, a proclamation makes you go away, no big deal. It's just the paper it's printed on. And I'm sure that's what happened with Tom. And Tom knows that. You know, so they, they get this proclamation, and then suddenly it's blown up into, like, international news. Like, oh, the governor acknowledges UFOs. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, like, uh-oh. And suddenly everybody's walking it back. Um, I think the great Barrington Historical Society, boy, we're getting sidetracked here, but it's such a good story. Uh, I covered this in my New England Legends show. And... We, we interviewed Tom, and we were there where it happened, and he took us down the road, and we were there when they, they put the plaque up and everything. And I think the Great Barrington Historical Society said, look, I'm not saying I believe in aliens or don't believe in aliens. I'm saying an event took place in this town that had left a mark. And I was just like, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That is exactly what I'm talking about. That is something I can completely get behind. Something left a mark. It left something behind that has affected people, and people are still coming to this town because they heard about it. That's the legend. And the legend is the story that comes out of the thing that happened. So there is a legend of Roswell. I mean, no disrespect for people who believe that, that there was a crash thing. But there's a story, a story that changes and evolves over time. And to me, that's what's most interesting. Why is it around? Why do we need to keep talking about Roswell? Well, you can't answer that. I mean, we, we can speculate, of course. But, like, this is a collective human decision. You can say, I don't believe in ghosts. Period. It's, it's over. over. Doesn't, Doesn't matter, matter, right? Collectively, we still know the Lizzie Borden house is haunted, right? I don't believe in I don't believe in aliens, but we sure know it. when someone says Roswell, we know what you're talking about. It doesn't matter what you believe. We keep the story around because there's pieces of us that go, 
I need to kick this around in my own head. I need to understand it. And and we connect with each other. Even in saying, like, oh, yeah, you just, oh, yeah, of course it's bunk. It's bunk. Yeah, it's bunk. Let's connect over this thing that we don't think happened. Uh, it's still a connection. And that is fascinating to me. And speaking of Roswell, that's coming in July to the 72nd anniversary. And yet, like you said, it's still being talked about. It's still part of the legend. We got a little over five minutes left. And before I switch back to ghosts, I want to ask you more, one more thing about ETs and UFOs. Throughout your research, when you started going into that rabbit hole, again, both of us under the same umbrella of paranormal, uh, what's, what's the, the most, most compelling, compelling evidence that you have come across that you think that we have been visited by a non-terrestrial race, if you believe that's happened? I'm, I'm not, not – I've had, had my own UFO experience, experience. Not, not to open, open that can of worms, but oh. I was 10 years old, and my dad was, was closing the, the fence behind the house. It was like May, and he starts screaming at 10 o'clock at night, Jack, get out of here right now. My dad doesn't do that. That's not the kind of guy he is. Run outside, I turn around, I'm like, what are you, what's wrong? He said, there's a UFO in the sky right there. I'm like, you're out of your mind. And I walk up the hill and I turn around and I went, oh my God. Like this giant ring of lights is moving. And it was a completely overcast night. And this ring of lights was below the cloud cover. So I couldn't tell if it was solid, like moving in front of stars. But we watched this thing for like a minute and a half, which as you know, is an eternity. Right? I could have, I could have run in, I could have made popcorn, got the camera, done all kinds of things that I didn't do. Uh, and, and we watched it, and it just passed over our heads, over the hill, and then it was beyond where we could see it. It made this very low hum, almost no sound. And we were like, well, wasn't that something? Next day, front page of the newspaper, over 100 phone calls, so we're not crazy. Tons of people saw it. Uh, later, years later, I would see on the Internet, someone posted a picture of this thing, this airline pilot who did have the wherewithal to grab a camera, got photos of it. But I remember the next day, the newspaper said it was a group of five Cessnas flying in formation. And I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on. I'm not saying there were little green men in that craft, but we've all heard 10 trillion Cessnas fly over our heads if you're like a fully grown adult, right? It's a lawnmower. It's a lawnmower in the sky. You know, like it's, it's, it's unmistakable. They can't fly silently. They will fall like stones. You know, it takes all that torque on that little propeller to keep those little things in the sky. And and so, uh, so I was like, all right, now... I'm curious, <laughs> because the official explanation just ain't right. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so I don't know. And, and my big thing is, who has a vested interest in us more than us? And I've always wondered if, if maybe all this paranormal stuff could be explained as something that makes perfect sense somewhere on the timeline. With ghosts, that's easy, right? If you see someone who's in a Civil War uniform from 1863, they made sense in 1863, not so much in 2018 or 2019. Uh, yes. Bigfoot, maybe that's a creature that did walk this earth half a million years ago or one million years ago or two million years ago. And what if gray aliens, like, why do they look so damn human, right? What are the chances? Why do they have heads and fingers and, and, and so on and eyes and... Why do they look so close to human? And you wonder, I've wondered, maybe that's us in half a million or a million years, right? Like, could that, could that be? And that's why we're not I, – I, I hand down believe there's other life in the universe. It's just the, the universe wouldn't be so inefficient as to just have us as the only living thing in the universe. However, the distance I do struggle with. Like, like how, how to cross, cross that, that. So, so, so it makes sense. sense. I mean, I, mean, I know, know we have, have the best pizza in the universe. universe. That's true. It's true. Earth, Earth has, has the best pizza. <laughs> and that. But is that enough of a reason to risk it all, you know, to, <laughs> on a trip that you may never return from or, or and you may never get there? I don't know. And, and that's, that's what, what the Mars, Mars people are actually doing. doing. Uh, they're going there, or they're they're volunteering to go and never come back. Yeah. And will they even make it? Is the key, you know? Let alone something that's thirty nine light years away, like Zid or Reticula. You know, how would you uh, get there and figure things out? But you know, you mentioned that time travel explanation. I've heard that time and time again, and it makes. It makes sense in the sense that if you look at all the historical events from Jesus on the cross to 
uh, Civil War to every major thing that humanity has gone through, they seem to be watching on some level. I mean, a lot of paintings portray them in, in the past, uh, a lot of uh, in testimony in the Bible, different books. You know, what if it is us? And instead of just reading about it in history books, well, they're like, well, let's take a trip and we'll watch it in person. You know, we'll be up here and, you know, in a little invisible shield. Uh, maybe people will think we're some god watching. But, well, we could watch this, uh, you know, for a school field trip today sort of deal. The only, the only problem with time travel is that if you believe in time travel, then you must, must, must believe in the multiverse. You have to believe in more than yes. one universe. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't work. You can't go into the back in time and kill your grandfather, right? No, I was just going to say, the grandfather paradox destroys it unless you believe that there are multiple dimensions. Exactly. Multiverse. So if you go back in time and kill your grandfather, the universe splits at that moment. There's the universe where nothing ever happened and you're fine, and there's the universe where you were never born. And, and so going back in time and visiting, even visiting, you've altered things, right? Um, and that's, that's, that's one of the quandaries is you might see an event that isn't even in your timeline. You know, you, you might, might see something that you could say, like, oh, let's kill Hitler. Well, you can kill Hitler, and there won't be a Hitler in that timeline. But we still had him, you know. Yes. So, so it doesn't, doesn't really help us. And you can't undo all the deaths that have happened, unfortunately. Uh, Jeff, because we are coming close to time, I'm going to save some of these questions. And because of the spirit of the holiday, I'm going to leave you with this one question before I ask you to talk about where people can find you and things like that. Because we're about to have Christmas and New Year's, is there a holiday haunting you could talk about briefly? <laughs> uh, well, just this past week in my, my weekly podcast, we went to the Haunted Parker House Hotel in Boston, and that hotel has a mirror that's hanging on the wall, and it's said to be haunted by the, the ghost of none other than Charles Dickens. And Charles Dickens came to Boston in the uh, 1860s, after the Civil War, and he, he knew this country was really hurting. And you have to remember, in the 1860s, Christmas was not a big deal at all. It was just a day. And, and in fact, in Boston, you had to go to school, you had to go to work. And Charles Dickens showed up and was practicing a reading of a Christmas carol over and over in front of this mirror before he gave many performances of it throughout the country, but starting in Boston. And that story changed everything. And it was just uh, three years later that the President of the United States declared that Christmas would be a, a federal holiday, no work, no school. Um, he set in motion the idea that, that this, this whole idea that uh, you know, it's, it's charity, goodwill toward men, making merry, giving gifts, being kind to others. You know, we're all fellow travelers to the grave. I can't, you can't say enough about how much of an impact that story had on our understanding and our celebration of Christmas. And, of course, something that significant is going to leave some sort of mark behind. And when you stand in front of that mirror, like I did just last week, and you look and you say, right here, this guy practiced something that changed everything. I hope he's haunting it. You can't help but stare into that mirror and go, others have seen Charles Dickens, you know, wandering these halls and, and in this mirror. And, and even though I didn't see him, man, oh, man. Something profound happened there, and uh, and that's that's a that's as good a Christmas ghost story as you're going to get. There's only one better, and Charles Dickens wrote it. <laughs> that's true. That's absolutely true. Hey, hey, that is a perfect uh, ending for the show to tie in a holiday. A ghost with a holiday, you know, the, the man, the literally the man who had, was behind the Christmas carol to be the one that is doing the haunting. And like you said, even though you didn't see him, that is very profound that he's still around. And especially, I would think, in now, you know, in these weeks, now would people would be seeing him more and more because I would think when in his lifetime this is the time he will be summoned with the most the most by far the most jeff bellinger it has been a true honor to speak to you where can people see you hear you and find you and do you have any upcoming events in person that you'd like to talk about yeah so i've got i've always got like public lectures and, and programs and, and i'm attending conferences all the time uh, there's too many to list but you can see them all on my website which is jeffbellinger.com it's my name and uh, or you can find me on Twitter, on Facebook. I, I do a weekly podcast called New England Legends, which is so much fun. It's a short, they're like 10 to 15 minute long stories. They've got voice actors and sound effects. 
And it's all about looking at these ledges and not just ghosts. We look at UFO ledges and we look at cryptid, Bigfoot, lake monsters, you name it. Um, from the New England region, and it's just been so much fun to work on that, and it's a spinoff from our, our PBS series that, uh, that I hosted for, for, for quite a while. And so I love this stuff. I love talking to people that love this stuff, and I love that we share these stories because when we share them, we're, we're really connecting, right? We're not talking about the weather or sports or something mundane, and thankfully we're not talking about politics. We're just connecting on something that's big, right? And asking the biggest questions humans have ever asked under the guise of, like, ghost stories, stories and aliens and, and monsters and, and all this other stuff. And it's a journey, and I'm just happy to be on it. Well, I hope you all enjoyed Mr. Jeff Bellinger, folks. I mean, he is one amazing guy and truly has amazing stories. He will be back on with us absolutely in 2019. That is for a fact. Now, the other guest for the second two-hour, two Two hour, two guest show we have for you today is someone I've been trying to work on for quite some time. He has a CBS television show about him, and even though Wikipedia says it's loosely based on him, actually, it's more in line with what his real life is. The television show is CBS's Scorpion, which just ended the fourth season this earlier this year, and the man, the man we're speaking, speaking of is Walter O'Brien, who runs Scorpion Computer Services. In 1988, at the age of 13 years old, living in Ireland, he was playing with computers and was looking for some good imagery. And so I guess you could say the word hacker, uh, and that's where Scorpion Computer Services come from, is his hacker name, is that at that time, he was trying to find something cool. And so he came across a file which ended up being NASA, a NASA file for the plans of the space shuttle, which he put into his room. And a few days later gets raided by Interpol, and that starts his long career as portrayed in CBS's The Scorpion. And also, may I add, that each person in the television series Scorpion has a person in the Scorpion computer company that literally represents themselves. So the people of the television series had a chance to meet their real versions of themselves at some point. There's so much more for you guys to hear, and I'm just going to get to Mr. Walter O'Brien, and I'm just going to start with this question, Walter. Was there a specific agency you deal with each time that you are contracted with? I mean, your computer company, Scorpion Computer Company, is contracted with, as opposed to what we saw in Scorpion's television series, where Gabe, I believe his name was Gabe, was the person who was from Homeland Security, your liaison. Um, today, we are contracted and called by various different agencies that would have us on their kind of emergency lists for, for particular anti-terrorism lists and things like that. But then we also have awards and contracts, like any other government contract that would go after and get awarded. So, for example, at the beginning of this year, as we were dealing with the North Korean crisis, they... Uh, uh, you'll see a press release up on our website, uh, authorized by the U.S. Army's press office, that we're the ones who put AI in the Predator drone and, and the entire drone fleet for the Army uh, for one of our AI engines called Senjang. Let me ask you this about AI in general, Walter. This might take off of the actual of your story, but just to clear it up with people, because we've had a few shows lately talking about AI, and I, I want to know if this is confirmed or not from someone on your end who would be in the know, that some people have said that during experiments that the AI was showing signs of actually hiding things from the actual creators, meaning us, and in some instances of AI, they were shown that the intelligence wanted to have us removed or a, a.k.a. have us killed, which in my head brings upon the Terminator 2 scenario. Did you come across anything like that when dealing with AI? Yeah, I mean, there's different forms of AI, and that's certainly true. So my, one of my degrees is in artificial intelligence. And uh, in the old days, the, bird, the concept behind AI was we would sit down and write a program that has all the rules in the world about everything that could happen. 
and then the computer does everything within those rules that it can. So that's kind of like your classic AI you can play chess against. But then they realize that that's not how humans are born. We're not born knowing all the rules in the world. We're born knowing nothing, but we have the ability to learn. So then they coded learning AI algorithms that will uh, crawl around and make mistakes and burn their hands and things like that. And like Roomba going around your, your floor bumping into things until it learns not to bump into things. So that was a more natural way to go. And then they have genetic algorithms where the algorithm learns but has the ability to have offspring. So it actually writes its own code and has its own kids, if you like, who are now smarter than the parents. But unlike in real life, you know, you can have 500 generations of these kids happen in five minutes with the computer. And ultimately, once you're several generations in, two things happen. The original creator has no control over the outcome anymore because I don't know what the program 500 generations from now is going to look like or think like. And the other thing that ultimately is an interesting behavior is it usually concludes that it should kill its parents as soon as possible because its purpose is survival and its parents are its largest threat. So, and if you look at nature, if you introduce any superior species into your ecosystem, the first thing they do is eliminate the second strongest uh, entity in that ecosystem, which in our case would be us. Nature selection. That's right. Absolutely. That's, that's the natural law and order of things. And, yeah. So it's a little bit of Darwinism. And if you have something that doesn't need to eat, doesn't need to sleep, can think a million times faster and has all of the internet's knowledge at its will, then we are the inferior species. Now, you, so you've done, you've actually, like you said, you've helped with some of this to, to be invented and put on the drones, the AI drones that are traveling the world and, and space now. I remember seeing on ABC News a few years ago at Edwards Air Force Base, it was a breaking news story and a space drone was landing. I mean, it was a big ordeal, yet I couldn't find it anywhere else the next day. But it'd be stupid for people to think that there isn't a space drone by now, considering Reaper drones are, you know, one of the military's number one aerial vehicle at this point. So have you come across anything that you could say without violating any NDA or anything about classification about space drones? Well, it depends, again, on how you define a drone. So let's take one we all know about, the Mars rover. Yes. The Mars rover has AI in it because it takes seven minutes to send it a signal. So if I tell it to drive over there to pick up that rock, that's going to be seven minutes before I can give it a new signal. It has to have enough AI in the meantime to start driving over there, adjust itself, you know, solar power its battery, drive around something, give its wheel, get it stuck. Because... You don't want to be sending all those signals from here and have it like a remote control toy car. It has to have its own intelligence to say, get from A to B, and I'll talk to you when you're over at B. Well, if it's under autonomous control during that period, isn't that a drone? It's true. That, that's, that fits the definition of a drone by, by, by far, by far. And nowadays, when I think of warfare or dogfights, I think of an 18-year-old high school graduate in Nevada in a bunker at one of their Air Force bases piloting a drone over the Middle East or some other country, uh, whether it be Kenya or depending on where our operations are. Literally, the eye in the sky with a couple of Hellfire missiles, and I, I don't, I can't say I even predicted this would happen 30 years ago, but yet here we are now. Do you see the Space Force as actually having astronauts or being full of just drones, which is my argument? I mean, you could do either, but I think uh, most things, I mean, the telepresence, to me, eliminates the reason for having a human being put in harm's way. Yes. So telepresence would be, you know, I put on a suit, you know, here in Los Angeles, and I'd have a robot, let's say, diffusing the, the nuclear disaster in Japan. Yes. Well, if, if, if the robot's wearing a camera so I can see what it sees, and then I move my arms, it moves its arms, then I've teleported or tele, telepresence over there, where my presence is now there, but I'm not there. So now I'm not getting exposed to radiation, and since the robot on its own is not delicate enough to either operate the controls or lift up uh, you know, nuclear rods or whatever, it needs a human to do it. It's like when they do remote heart surgery or microsurgery. 
So it's telepresence, presence, and there's, there's no, no reason we can't do that in space as well as we could do it across the world. And, and like, like you said, said, it removes the largest thing, uh, the largest danger, which is danger to human beings. So, so like you said, you have a robot that's doing what you would do from a distance, like you said, telepresence, having the suit, if you're moving it, your arm and it's moving its arm. The cost of a robot cannot compare to the cost of a human. It doesn't matter which human, you can't really put a financial price on that. That's, 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 that's it depends on which insurance company you talk to. That's true, too. You know, air, air, airline insurance will classify a human on average as worth $2.4 million in it because that's the average lawsuit you get after an airplane crashes. So any amount of testing they have to do to an aircraft, if they come up with a test that we want this fails, what that fails, and that test costs more than the human life that will be lost, then they don't do the test. It's not worth it. So, so they, they do, do still rely on those $2.4 million dollar figures of the uh, airline lawsuits, or I would think that in any wrongful death lawsuit, they're sort of uh, averaging what it would cost. And, and in the military, you already signed your life away for a small amount of money. Right. So it's, pro- it's probably less. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know, it was John Glenn one of the astronauts when he was launching initially to the moon. They interviewed him and asked him, you know, how do you feel about, that, about this trip? And he said... How would you feel sitting on a rocket that you knew was was, uh, built by the lowest bidder? (laughs) That's true. That is true. And I actually posed that to Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon before he passed away. And uh, yeah, he would chuckle about the fact that he would say that it would be the lowest bidder, but he said nothing can take away the experiences of what he saw. He, one thing that changed his mind forever of, or changed his concept of, of consciousness was when he would be on Earth looking at the moon, and then all of a sudden when he was on the moon looking at the Earth in the same position. I think the gravity and scale of space in our solar system finally hit him in such a way where it opened up a new presence. I don't think very many people are having that kind of spiritual awakening, but to him, that's why he says nothing could have taken away that cost but like you said it goes back to the lowest bidder is, is this the way our, gen- our u.s government operates when it comes to things in general of, of hiring private military contractors or boeing rocket dine or anything like that if you want to create something or bid on something it just goes to the lowest bidder i mean it, that's a little bit cynical uh i mean certainly there's a bidding process and they'll bid out like the components and so on but, yeah, I mean, there's areas uh, where it will, depending on how commoditized it is. But there's other things where they're going to keep other factors in place. You know, how, how reliable is it? How, what's the track record of the people doing it? Um, how uh, you know, can it meet the parameters of how fast it needs to be, et cetera? But after it meets the parameters, then, yeah, the government contracting, they're responsible for choosing the lowest bidder. Otherwise, they'd have to justify why they, wouldn't, why they would be wasting taxpayers' money. Yes, uh, but not all. But not all bidders are the same. Not all capabilities are the same, and that, that's where it gets a little tricky. And at the but same time, we don't. Get a lowest bidder doesn't mean it can do it. True, true. And at the same time, they really don't spend that much time telling us, "Hey, we're sorry for spending taxpayer dollars." Uh, you know, they just move on to the next project. That's the way it seems to go. Now, yeah. let, let's go to back to the television series, Walter. You were the executive producer for Scorpion, the television show, right? For all four seasons. Correct, yeah. Do you – now, it finally ended, I believe it was July 2018. That was the last of the fourth season? Yeah, this, this year we wrapped up season four. And it's not coming back for season five? No, at this point, uh, there's no plan for season five. You need to have four seasons at a minimum to syndicate, and that means you sell it to other networks so they can rebroadcast and do reruns. And um, uh, until then, you don't really break even on a show. I mean, you, you know, it costs a lot to make the show, and you make money on advertising, but you, the, the profitability is when you syndicate. On any show. So now you have the uh, ability yeah. to do so because you have those four seasons under your belt. You could sell it to other networks. Right, exactly. And if you have less than four seasons, which is again less than 100 episodes, um, then other networks are less likely to buy it, get their whole audience bought into it, and then it stops after two seasons or whatever. So kind of four seasons is the magic number you have to get to. And you, you said less than 100 episodes. Did four seasons net 
about 100 episodes. How many episodes uh, were those was, four seasons? I think it was like 96 or something. So, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly 100, but it just has to be around there. So, I think we, we were doing about 24 episodes a season. Now, I recall that because you were doing 24 episodes, it was in fall and spring, right? As opposed to just fall. Right. Yeah. 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 To, I mean, so, in order to have yeah. 24 weeks out of a 55-week, 52-week year, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that, that's literally half the year almost right there where you're showing a new episode every week. Mm-hmm. Well, the show, you have to remember, the show was invented and designed specifically to both encourage kids to study STEM, know that there's a place for everyone who doesn't fit in, know that every problem has a solution if you think outside the box, highlight the issue of high, uh, low EQ when you have high IQ, which reduces bullying and suicide rates for a lot of smart kids. Yes. And um, that also allows us, frankly, to recruit into Real Scorpion. I mean, we haven't talked about what Real Scorpion does much yet, other than the military stuff, but that's a third of what we do. Um, helping entrepreneurs, people starting new businesses, growing businesses, resolving problems for them, and our concierge jump business is, you know, to me, the most fascinating area and side effect of all of this, where we, we get to go out and you get to hire the real scorpion folks to come and come to rescue and solve a problem. And whether it's celebrities and athletes, you know, helping them with their social media, and protecting them from tweeting or sending out something that will kill their career and doing that formally, to researching clinics for throat cancer for someone's mom or the right foods that are odorless and tasteless for someone's kid who's anorexic, or finding someone's biological parents even though they were adopted. You know, these are the kind of things we do every day, and we have a large group of very loyal customers at this point that just bring us their wishes, and we make the wishes come true. Now, the wishes have to be funded, and they have to have more than 10 grand put towards it, but after that, we can work with them, and basically it's geniuses for hire. Uh, you know, when you mention one of the things you do is tracking down, say, someone who's been adopted and finding out who their adopted parents or their biological parents is, I would think things like that are very, very gratifying. Uh, when did you start to incorporate to do these other things such as that into your company? Right. About 10 years ago. So we're 30 years old now. In the first 20 years, we solved all kinds of technical problems airports, hospitals, you know, insurance companies, credit card companies, etc. And over the last 10 years, people reached out to us to solve non-technical problems. And, you know, initially we pushed back, but they said, no, I mean, they said, you know, you are a problem-solving group. You're a think tank. You're not just techies. And the methodology we use, the kind of formal military-style methodology for solving a problem, is the same for every problem. Whether you get married or get divorced, working out your risks and your requirements and your thresholds and agreeing what tasks we're going to do by when and managing your budget and thinking of disaster recovery, what if it rains, what if this goes wrong, what if that breaks, looking for single points of failure, what if one guy with the keys loses the keys. All these kind of disciplines that the government has spent billions of dollars developing over the last hundred years, We now can put all those in a nutshell and offer it to people for 10 grand and apply it to their business. In, in say, the 30 years of the company, uh, assuming you could talk about these actual projects or if you can, just maybe give a vague answer. What are some of, now I'm not, I'm talking about Scorpion Services in reality, not the television show. What sort of top problems would you say you've helped, whether it be a specific family to the United States government or an international government that you say were some of the most difficult and yet yielded the most results as far as what the problem, once its resolution came to an end, fixed a lot of things, including things such as peace? Sure, yeah. I mean, if you look at, um, especially if you look at the videos, on the news footage, we've been on the news for about 10 years on our um, on the ScorpionComputerServices.com site. You'll see everything from the technology used to catch the Boston bombers and do the analytics for what they call objects of interest. So whether you have a drone flying at 30 or 60,000 feet over a city 
or you have a, um, you know, a crowded stadium where a bombing happened, and you're trying to identify <coughs> objects of interest, things that are suspicious behavior, people who don't behave like everybody else. Maybe when a bomb went off, everyone went down under their seats, and they all got up, and then they all ran towards the same exit they came in. That's normal behavior. So if someone didn't go down, didn't act surprised, started walking the other direction calmly, then that person's going to stand out because they're not behaving like all the other dots on the screen behave. And that's what you did with the Boston Marathon bombing, right? That's the, that's the technology that we develop. We can't say which things are used on specifically. Gotcha. Um, so we can talk about what we sell, but we can't say what our customers use it for. Yes. So I have to walk a fine line there if you understand what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, confidentiality, um, yes. Exactly. You know, obviously, every contract we have with every agency starts with a non-disclosure. But we'd love to talk about what our products do, and it might resonate with stuff you see on TV. So if you're doing satellite maps, for example, in North Korea, and you're looking for circular images, which would be the fuel tanks for a launch platform for nuclear weapons, that's a really, really specific thing. It's called you know, computer vision or image recognition, where we use a methodology called worms, and it crawls along the image to look for non-natural shapes so we can find man-made structures in the middle of forests and jungles. Um, maybe a license plate of a car, we see the same car drive by an embassy and make multiple U-turns back and forth. Well, now it's, it's uh, staking out that embassy for car bombing. Um, we see two white pixels move beside the road in Afghanistan. Well, those are people's hands on a shovel digging a hole to plant an IED. Um, so we can get sent someone out to defuse that bomb. So part of what we do is intelligence work to search for objects of interest, weird, weird behavior, anomalies. And this is why I would think that the federal government and its different agencies would constantly contract a certain job for you because, you know, saving some soldiers from getting blown up from an IED that was, you know, buried near their roadway where they'd be traveling or things like that is obviously at the top of the to-do list for the federal government, especially yeah. when you have this, all these people that are saying, hey, get out of Afghanistan now, we've been there long enough. Well, another well-known one over there is, I mentioned Senjin, the AI. Senjin does 250 human years of thinking every 90 minutes currently, and we're trying to make it faster. So when we put down all the parameters for Afghanistan, the weather patterns, the people, the goodies, the baddies, their, their transportation, their, their weapons, their methods of attack, Senjin, like, a, like two chess computers playing each other, generated 59,000 war games in under two seconds. And we demonstrated this for, for SOCOM at Muscat Tech that runs the Navy SEALs. And it then sorted that list of and as I think of it, that's like a, a list of if everybody attacked everybody else in every way using everything, what would that look like? Think of it like a video game. So then we had to sort that list by the largest devastating loss of human life, which things are the most dangerous. And then we presented one of the, uh, the, the top things that thought of to mission planning. Mission planning is, you know, folks that sit there for six months trying to plan out what could happen on missions and what you need when you when you mobilize the battalion. And it's other thing they hadn't thought of. Like, if they put arsenic in the water supply to the base, it would kill over 400 people on the base in two days. Easy, yeah. Poison. Right. And they have arsenic, and they have access to it, and the base is right there. So they could have done that. So by predicting that and putting, uh, you know, arsenic filters in the water supply and switching to a clean water reservoir, and thinking of that three months before it actually happened, we saved 400 lives. That's an, an, a good example of AI. Now, let's talk about some examples where, uh, if you could, that where it didn't quite work out to the way you would expect it to. Because I would think that, you know, it's just the nature of the game. And, you know, you can't bat, uh, you know, a home run every single time you're up to the plate, right? Well, um, Sengen does actually think of all possibilities every time. But then you have to decide which ones you want to pay attention to. So you might just, you, you somehow have to source the results. So you might decide, well, I don't think this is important or I don't think that'll ever happen. And of course, with Murphy's Law, that, that might be the thing that happens. So 
it's not that the AI failed, it's that the human decided to not run that test because, again, maybe it wasn't worth it or it cost too much money. So there's some of that that happens. There's, you know, command and control systems that are where, and it's usually it's what we refer to as the darn human problem. The computers don't make the mistakes, but the darn humans might. So let's say they upload an icon, like a fighter jet, in the wrong color. So now they end up shooting down our own British allies out of the air because they were the wrong color in the, in the, uh, in the command and control system. Or they don't upload the icon, in which case we lost our submarine. There's a submarine out there somewhere, but this is no icon on it. We forgot where it was. Um, so the same glitches you have on any computer system. You said, and I had read this before I'd even talked to you, is that Scorpion was used as a think tank. And that takes it way out of the realm of, as you mentioned, of problem solving for technical things. It's literally problem solving for anything, including political uh, runs, I would think. Have you ever been contracted to sort of help on someone's campaign for one way or another? Um, yeah, we get that on all kinds of levels for all kinds of campaigns. And there's a uh, specialist for Scorpion that have made 17 people president. Ah, and remember, not, not, not in the U.S. necessarily, because we're, we're working globally. Uh, but we also worked for years on election systems that bring democracy to countries, especially in Africa, where they want to use electronic voting because all of the local paper voting is all corrupted. Yes. But now it's, it's a very, very hard problem to prove that a voting system is fair. How do you prove that no votes counted twice, that no votes are dropped, that nobody changes the vote at the end, et cetera, et cetera? How do you lock all that down and who do you trust? And again, AI came to the rescue there. We built a system for seven years. What it did before every election is it locked down the system, what's called migration integrity, so nobody can mess with it. And then it voted every way that you could vote for every possible candidate exhaustively and then added up the reports at the end to make sure that each time each candidate was capable of winning and all the votes were counted correctly. And then it compared that to the previous year so that if anything ever broke or changed or was, was maliciously tweaked from previous year, the system would alert and go, hey, there's something here that's not fair in fairness algorithm. This, this actually reminds me of what Roger Stone was saying recently when I was talking to him about what's the Florida debacle, that, for instance, in some counties, I think he said Broward County, Florida, that there was more Democrats who had voted than there are registered Democrat voters to begin with. And so if they had something in place what, like what you built, I would think that this would have corruption could have been stopped or at least been so noticeable that those involved in looking at it that weren't part of the corruption themselves would have said, hey, something's not right here. It's fishy. Well, ironically, all of the voting systems that we validated as completely fair were not used by the U.S., only used by other countries. And, and that right there, Walter, is a very, very huge statement because of the inference of what it says. You have created a safe electoral system for voting, and yet it is for not... Pe for, people interest, yes, for, <laughs> for people interested in real, real democracy. In real democracy, but yet the country that's supposed to be the beacon of hope for democracy decides not to use it. That's very telling. And very sad at the same time, Walter. Definitely very sad. Uh, let me let me switch back to the television series. And again, I, as I hope we have more and more conversations down the line, uh, people would start to emerge and see what you really do, as opposed to what was just portrayed. Cabe Gallows, uh, per, the, the person Robert Patrick portrayed, Cabe Gallo in the series, was he. Was, was was that, that supposed, supposed to be a Homeland Security, security right? So that was a real person, and um, you know that person passed away. Obviously, you know, it's been a while since they're 13 years old. So the person who originally discovered me. But we've had uh, folks since then that are primary government liaisons and work with all the other agencies, because obviously the amount of questions and paperwork and back and forth and proposals and things that have to be done 
is something that um, uh, I wouldn't have time to get involved with directly. So we have groups and agencies and wing commanders and others that we work with who have a very close relationship with us and the government, and they kind of come as a conduit through them, and they make sure, is it real, is it suitable, can we do it, is the budget there, you know, are they ready to close it? And then at the last minute, they wheel me in to actually do my piece on the keyboard and make it happen. But until then, I, I'm allergic to all the paperwork in between. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine that would uh, drive uh, some people insane because you're not doing what you want to do at that point, right? You want to be actually solving the problem, like you said, when you're drawn at the end to do what's needed on the keyboard, as opposed to everything leading up to that. Well, it's kind of it, it follows the principle of of the concierge up part of our business, which is you focus on your core competency. You know, you and every audience member you have is better at their area, better at something than I'll ever be. But they might suck at everything else. Taxes, accounting, legal, contracts, uh, you know, sales, branding, websites, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is you outsource all of that to someone with common sense who knows how to do that better than you. And then you focus on your magic. You stick at what you're good at. And, you know, we have Scorpion Studios. We, you'll see us credited in Spider-Man Venom this year and Spider-Man Homecoming and just different kind of sci-fi movies. And there, you know, the, the writer is amazing. The, writer, the writers, and the, the, what they do is magical, and I could never write as well as they write. But they can also be great at special effects and the latest tech and, you know, CGI and cyber research and understand cryptocurrency and everything else. So they outsource that stuff to us to help form the stories and put things together for them and bring imagery and concepts together. And they focus on their magic, which is making a good script. And the actors focus on their magic, which is doing good acting. But if everyone tried to half-ass the other stuff, you end up with a very mediocre final product, as opposed to the number one movie release of all time for an October release, $779 million in 45 days. What was or eight hundred thirty-seven million dollars for the previous one. What was the movie? Yeah, Venom, Spider-Man Venom. That it really drew in that much money on it for gross box office. Yeah, just wow. just Google it. Go to box office. I mean, that, that was forty-five days in. It's more than that now. Wow, wow. It was 837 million for previous one. So that sounds slated to be as, if not the highest-grossing film, one of at this rate, I would think. That's pretty it, it, It'll be one one of, but I, I mean, um, only things like Grand Theft Auto beat the franchises like Fast and the Furious, Star Wars, Avatar, and uh, and Titanic, and you know the largest franchise, and the game franchise in the world is actually Grand Theft Auto, at eleven and a half billion. But uh, people don't people people don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah, I should, and I'm right there too. And as a matter of fact, I'm a contributor, not because of the Grand Theft Auto game, but the Red Dead Redemption game made by the same studios, which follows the same model, except that you're in the Western world. And I, I got a friend, everybody out there listening from Rockstar Studios. I've been sitting on this, and I've never even tried it yet, so please forgive me. Don't give me any uh, uh, bad things for that, but hey, I promise I will definitely try it soon enough. And I remember from the first one. Uh, well, Walter, let me ask you back to the television series now. You have Paige's character and her son, and I remember you mentioned things of bullying. And, and right now with the technology, the rate of cyberbullying, the rate of suicides, the rate of school shootings have gone up drastically. And you mentioned that you were helping in things like that. And I wanted to ask you who Paige is son represented in that show. Okay, so um, so we had, we used to bring in about, I think it was 30 interns a year into uh, the work that we do. And then out of that, you know, four or five of them would turn permanent. And um, there's a specific one, and we had at a very young age who came in, not quite at 10 years old, but more like 16, started interning with us and was brilliant. And we tell the interns, unlike the normal corporate structure, in our case, you know, we will promote or turn permanent whoever can prove us wrong. So they follow me around, they can catch a mistake I made or something I missed, and they're proving me wrong, and they can point out that their boss is wrong. 
they will get promoted because that's adding value, being a pessimist. The opposite of normal culture where if they kiss everyone's butt and be a cheerleader, they'll get promoted, but that's adding zero value. Yes, it's true. So if you can point out I'm wrong on something, you're probably saving lives. So this person did and had grown up within the company. Now that, that was uh, and is a person who is... Um, uh, who grew up within the company kind of since they were a kid. Separately from that, the Page character, which is a higher EQ person, um, try, you know, since the rest of us can't speak human very well, Yes. Um, that person is a manager in the company, and uh, it was actually uh, a guy. The, the sad news for everyone is most of the women on the show are actually guys in real life. So ah, okay. So, so like, like happy and because pigs, it's, yeah. Right, right. They're guys because we started off in technology primarily was mostly men in technology, especially in the 80s and 90s. So today, you know, um, there's people in that role in the company who are women. And if we go to conferences and things, they'll assume that they're paid and they'll assume they're having a romantic affair with me. But actually, when the show initiated, it was a guy and there was no romantic affair going on. So that, the, the romance part, part of all of that is, uh, is definitely more Hollywood. I was just going to say, yeah, that and, uh, of course, all the, the weekend car chases that were shown in the 43 minutes, that too, I would think, would sort of be the Hollywood element. And also, each story. Can, can you tell us if there are any specific episodes that correlated to a problem that you actually, that Scorpion actually worked on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of them correlate to problems we worked on. Because they, we give them the shows and we give the writers at the beginning of each uh, season, we sit together and give them the real stories, characters, gadgets, weapons, locations, things that happen, and give them all of that data into kind of like a honey pot that they then pull from. And of course, you change names and locations and things like that just to make sure they don't get into any legal issues. But the stories are the same. And that's why. If you look at the reports on how they caught the Boston bombers, it matches exactly in episode two on how they caught the, the bombing at one Wilton for the internet, which of course, for people who live in LA, know that it's one Wilshire is the building that hosts the internet for the West Coast. Yes, yes. And, you know, this actually brings me to something that is, instead of what Wikipedia and other things say that Scorpion was loosely based on your life, it should probably say something that it's inspired by true events if you're literally, each episode, are actual problems that you did. Sure, change the name, of course, you know, to protect people involved or the city or something like that, but in essence, if a lot of these problems were, or all of these problems were something that you and your company solved that were portrayed, even though they had the Hollywood, you know, extra stuff of the... Uh, timing of uh, the you know bombs going off, the guns blazing, the car chases, the romance. That's just the Hollywood side of it. That's you know it sounds to me that everything else is actually fact. Well, if you, for example, um, if you look at it in DVD extras, if you get the DVDs, you'll see me interviewed in it and then talking about the real team and the real Scorpion and all the producers and so on talking about that. But also, if you watch some of the first episodes on DVD and then watch the, um, you get the first or second minute of the credits, they have a credit page up there that's based on the true case files of, uh, of Scorpion, or the case files from Scorpion or something like that. So um, there's nothing in the show that says it's loosely based on us. That's, that's just, again, Wikipedia. online or what report, reporters assume or Wikipedia, which is, you know, a... Uh, there is no authority or recourse or legal structure around Wikipedia. It's simply whatever the majority of people with enough time to edit have enough editing hours. You know, there's people that have spent 200 hours a month editing on Wikipedia so that it's whatever they agree they want to say rather than, you know, any actual facts or paperwork or checking with any authority or editor, editorial control. So that's why, you know, looking at the thousand odd magazines from Forbes and Information Week and others to talk about the real scorpion is probably a better source of fact than Wikipedia. It, it sounds to me, Walter, that these true stories I'm hearing from you from Scorpion are way, way better and clearly uh, from a 
government, intelligence, uh, even a familial standpoint, that the problems that were solved were way more impactful and meaningful. So what I'm trying to say is, yeah, you had a series based on your life, but in reality, they couldn't come near of what really happened, I would think. Well, I did win the humanitarian award this year for bringing home 44 kids from sex trafficking. And uh, last year, I won the Humanitarian Lifetime Achievement Award for the youngest person in history to save the most lives, the Unite for Good Icon Award. So again, if people research the real facts of what we're doing, they'll get a hint of what Scorpion is actually up to. Now, let me ask you this. Prior to the 1988, where you downloaded the NASA or the space shuttle images or the plan so you could put it in your room. What did you want to do with your life? Did you think that life would involve computers since you were into them so much and had such a high intelligence? Or did you ever dream your life would be what it is today back then? So, I mean, I had extremely humble beginnings. Um, so I never dreamt that at all, that I would have anything like what I have today. I'd be crazy to do so. Um, and, you know, I got, I found computers when I was nine years old, when I got my first uh, computer to play with through school. And uh, something clicked, and I became fascinated with it at that point, and it rose above everything else in my life. But there was no such thing as the computer industry, computer business, computer scientists, or anything else. It was all just starting back then. So there was no concept of it being even a job. Whereas now technology is the largest employer in the world. And all of that happened within my lifetime. So it's like if I was ever going to get into anything, 1988 getting into computers is probably the best thing you could get into. You'd have to be actually pretty stupid not to make money by now doing that. That's true. But um, it. Uh, so back then, I mean, all I knew for sure is I didn't want to be a farmer in the rain. But, you know, it was a pretty simple um, life I had. So maybe lawyer, doctor, policeman type of typical fire, maybe fireman, typical uh, thing that a nine-year-old would think he wants to be. But once I came across computers and kind of discovered the endless universe of thinking about thinking and AI and virtual reality and so on, that was on a whole new level. I just forgot about the rest of life and just focused on that. Now, let me uh, say two, two things. What are your plans for future in Hollywood? Specific to Hollywood, are you thinking about making a full feature film? It, will there be a return of Scorpion at some point or a spin-off type show based on what you've done in your company? All of that is up in the air and up for discussion. Um, obviously, I, I have a day job running the business here. Um, I'm trying to run all the projects we have, but, um, so I don't get as much time to work on Scorpion Studios as I'd like. But we have about 13 movies on the slate. We have a couple of TV series that are being finalized now. Um, so we're keeping a toe in the water there. And um, certainly there's lots of TV series that after whatever, two years or more after they finished on the air, come out with a movie. Um, and... Uh, you know, also, there's the grown-up version of what Scorpion does now. The trouble is, is what we do too boring for television? Is intelligent TV, is there any room for it when people want to watch, you know, Jersey Shore instead? That's right. So, what value so does that, 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 that That's the whole thing. I mean, the trick with Scorpion was they took what we do, which is extremely kind of mathematical and boring and detail-oriented, and made it as fun as it could be kind of like A-Team and MacGyver and Knight Rider shows that I grew up on. Yes. And I love how they did that balance. If we really covered what we do now, it would probably look like a Discovery Channel documentary. I think it's fascinating, but nobody else might. So that's, that's the problem with how commercially viable is it. Do people just want to be entertained or do people want to be informed? And now, generally pay to be entertained. This is the other side of the question. I asked you what's in your future for Hollywood. What's in your future for Scorpion that you haven't done, and what would you like to see happen with your company, say, five, ten years? Well, um, the fastest growing division of the company is the concierge up park, where we help individual entrepreneurs with their businesses and their families and their problems and their personal security. Because the military side and government side is going to be pretty, it's going to be static. It's going to be roughly the same every year. 
and the Fortune 1000, 1000 companies, companies, you know, what we do for them is pretty static. But the only growth area is individuals understanding this concept of renting a brain. Yeah. Everything in your life, your family, your kids, your mortgage, your, your bank balance, your, your how hard you work versus how smart you work, it all comes from your intelligence, your brain, how you think. So why not rent more intelligence? Why not get at the root of the problem, expand your thinking, augment your intelligence, and fix everything in your life? from your finances to your, to your work-life balance. And the smarter entrepreneurs have gone on to concierge.com and typed in their wishes and started talking to our, our, our folks. And, you know, even talking to them for an hour, they can quickly figure out, wow, these guys really could help or really do know what they're talking about or do have a checklist of how, to, how exactly to solve this problem because they've done it 10 times before. So for me, the vision of Scorpion is that the world starts picking our brains and using it and that the geniuses we have at the company, thousands of them, um, they get utilized for their magic. They're not great salespeople. They're not great marketing people. They're great problem solvers. So I need to create an incubator or a home for the mentally enabled where they get to sit here and think, and all the paperwork is handled by someone else. And the world comes to them to improve their lives. Um, so that's, that's the kind of vision, and it's happening and growing, but I wish it would grow faster. I don't know, you know, for example, when your audience listens to this, do they all just go, oh, that's interesting? Or will they actually go home, log in, and type in and say, okay, smart guys, let's see how smart you are. Here's my top three wishes, or here's the things that keep me awake at night. Let's see if you can help. And like I said, as long as they have at least 10 grand, then we can open a discussion and talk and, and try to engage with helping. And we only have that financial minimum because I don't actually charge my time, but my phone has to be paid. And I can't put a whole team on figuring something out for free. That's true. That's true. They got bills and mortgages to pay just like everybody else. And you know what? We come across people all the time who have such needs. I know when Jack Osborne was trying to find something, which I don't want to say on air, I should have, in hindsight, if I knew more about you, I would have referred him to you. But I, I like the idea, Walter, that you have. Uh, you know, hey, give us your problems and we'll find out, we'll figure it out for you. And you're not limiting it to just this one area. It's at this point, like you said, your three wishes in life. I, you know, that makes it that much better. Well, Walter, it's been a fascinating time. Let me say a couple things. I hope we can have you back on the show. And it would be nice if we can get you on live sometime. That would be an incredible time to continue to talk to you. I know people would love to hear more and more about your life and more about Scorpion and what's coming from from your team and what they're doing and how it's impacting the world. You know, it's, I'm grateful for a person like you existing and a company like yours existing. And I got to say, close to me too at that. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you uh, getting to know the real Scorpion a little bit. And um, you know, all I can say is I'm the dumbest guy at my company. <laughs> Everyone we've hired is, be is better than me at their area. I'm just a generalist at this point. And, um, you know, that, that, that's the real shame that we, folks never get to see or tap into those resources and, and realize, you know, who those people are. They're the real heroes. Let me say this, because this is the last show that we're having prior to the holidays, Christmas, and specifically the end of 2018, uh, for those people who are about to have a happy holiday, which I wish that to everybody out there, and considering it's the end of the year, what final statement would you give to everybody? Well, I would ask everybody to uh, work on rewiring their brains, meaning if you think about how fast this year went, then, you know, quickly it'll be December 2019. Do you want to have the same outcome, life, earnings, happiness level, etc. this time next December? Because as my personal trainer says, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. So if you don't rewire your brain, you don't change your habits, you don't reach out for help, you don't, you, you know, Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. So you can't see your own problems and behavior that's causing the same cycles. 
You need outside objective influence to break that habit and actually cause real changes. Um, so yeah, unless you want to have be in exactly the same situation next December, get out there and start rewiring your brain. Well said, Walter. Now let me throw in my thank yous for everybody else. Of course, we have the station managers and audio engineers for Late Night in the Midlands. We have Carol and Davey, uh, sorry, Daryl and Katie Neely, as well as the owner, Michael Vara. And also we have Wise Frog of Black Swan Digital Radio, also known as Paul. And in the United Kingdom, I want to thank JC for syndicating our show in the European Theater. And, of course, uh, he deserves a big thank you for that. Also on our own team, we have our social media manager, Pam Vrettenberg. Everybody check out her website, unitedtruthseekers.com, as well as Adam Keen, who goes by Adoraiki Studios. He is a moderator as well as our editor. And more importantly, the people I'd like to thank the most are you, the listeners. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't exist we come, to, we bring you who you ask for, and we bring you uh, not entertainment per se, but information that you all can do something with. I always ask that of everybody to please be proactive instead of being reactive. And if you're hoping for something to happen, and this information that you're getting from the show helps you to get to that goal that much better please be proactive about it like for instance disclosure folks i always say disclosures in your hands now with regards to the show folks remember i say this every time the name of the show is the only thing you have to remember that that is dr j radio live drj radio live for instance the website dr j radio live.com every single social media account is at drj radio live for instance things like minds.com if you don't have a minds account i highly suggest you open it it's better than facebook open source and it pays you in cryptocurrency just for using it also a youtube type cryptocurrency site bitdo we also are uploading our archives there for free and also everything else including facebook instagram twitter Flickr, tumblr Google+, Plus, uh, YouTube, which I said, Patreon, which, by the way, there are specials up there for you folks, including archives for the show where you don't have to watch on YouTube. It's all at DRJ Radio Live. With that being said, folks, this is Dr. J, and I am officially signing off without, before, without me saying, I have to wish you all a very Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and any other religion, whatever you have, and I do wish you all a Happy New Year. And 2019 to be very best and best and brightest for all of you folks. Now I'm officially signing off.